we've got Juno Park, who did his PhD uh, in Paris with Paul Bion, and he's done postdoc positions in uh, in Korea uh, and in the US, and most recently has been in um, in Saclay, uh, CA Saclay, working with Stefan Matisse and others, uh, and he's now just moved to Coventry University, where he's now uh, a lecturer, and he'll be talking about instabilities and transition to turbulence in stratified rotating fluid. All right. So yeah, so thank you for inviting me for this seminar. So I'm Juno, and for today I will talk about the instabilities and transition in stratified rotating fluid in a, for application to, to a geophysical and, and astrophysical context. So I'm gonna, for today I'm gonna talk about instabilities and transition. This is my favorite movie to see we, where we can see the boundary layer with some uh, small wave entering. And you see that the, due to the instability, it grows. And then uh, through the transition process, it becomes fully turbulent. So I was really fasc fascinated by this phenomenon. And we can observe this one in many cases in nature or engineering for many different type of flow. <clears throat> So for instance, uh, we can observe in geophysical vortices that uh, they can support some type of instability called radiative instability. I don't know if you can see this uh, right-hand side part. Uh, but anyway, uh, of course, the cloud formation around the hurricane and the instability is not the same one, very different. But I just want to mention that uh, maybe this uh, vortices can support the instability that can move transfer the momentum outward. So we are working on this phenomenon. And in laboratory experiment, we can easily observe some type of instability called the centrifugal instability for rotating flow. And you can see that the, when the rotation becomes uh, faster, the, we can observe transition and turbulence. Another engineering application is this one. You can see in this high-speed vehicle at supersonic speed, there's a very narrow uh, region from laminar to turbulence. But the thing is that the, this turbulence can make a huge uh, increase in the heat transfer so that it can cause a lot of structural damages. So that uh, it is so important to understand the instability and transition. And if you understand well, we can try to control the transition so that uh, we can avoid the the damages, or we can delay the damages. So for today's presentation, I will talk about the instabilities and transition in stratified and rotating fluid in the context of geophysics and astrophysics. So mainly in the beginning, I will talk about some theoretical stuff. So maybe you may know very well with the, the one, but I will just do <clears throat> explain a concept about the vortex and instabilities. And I'm gonna also show you some recent experiment that I did for the Taylor Quay flow with the stratified fluid. And if I have some more time, I will talk about some horizontal shear flow instability uh, in the configuration uh, matching the radiative zone in stars. So it's ap applied to astrophysics. And this is more theoretical stuff. <clears throat> so first I will talk about instabilities and transition in, I will say idealized geophysical vortices because the real geophysical vortices have, I know that it's very complex uh, structures, but uh, I will consider more simpler situation. And then I will study, I will do some mathematical analysis. So this is a very nice diagram for geophysical vortices <clears throat> on the, of parameter space of fruit number, which is about stratification, and Rossby number, which is about the Earth's rotation. So many different geophysical vertices are here, and you will see that the, the fruit numbers are typically between 0 0.1 and 10, so I will say nearly one. So I can say that the stratification is, uh, yeah, somehow moderate. But if you look at the range of Rossby number, it's really, it varies a lot, like 10 to the 5 or 0 0.1. And it me means that, in fact, for 
large uh, for small scale vertices they have a Rossby number or uh, larger than one so that uh, it means that the rotation can be negligible for small scale vertices but for large scale vertices their Rossby number is less than one so that the rotation is dominant so it is a bit very important when you study geophysical st uh, vertices we need to consider both stratification and earth rotation carefully uh, when uh, the fluid is stably stratified, we already, uh, I guess, because you are the, in the group of astrophysics and geophysics, so you may heard a lot about the internal gravity wave. So that the in stably stratified fluid, this small cylinder rotating or uh, oscillating with some frequency omega, they can generate the internal gravity wave. And this is a nice observation <coughs> of internal gravity wave. When there is a flow and over the island, due to the vertical motion of the flow, it can generate the internal gravity wave behind the island. So this is a very nice example of the internal gravity wave. But what I'm going to say today is that the vortex in stratified fluid, they can also support the internal gravity wave emission. This is not my experiment, but from the people in France, Marseille, that they do the, some experiment on the rotating cylinder. And you clearly see that there is some wave coming out from the rotating flow. And we call this uh, <coughs> phenomenon radiative instability. And in this uh, region, very near the cylinder, there's something interesting happened. And this is a key part of the radiative instability. So what's going on here? So it is known that the, imagine the situation that the vortex emits some internal gravity wave and this wave goes to an approach a uh, critical level where the angular velocity of the background flow equal to the frequency of the wave. And this is the point where mathematically singular and there's a chance that the wave can exchange the energy from the mean flow. And for the certain cases, this wave can extract the energy from the vortex and then they reflect back. <clears throat> but uh, since the while the energy is extracted, the momentum is conserved so that uh, there's also another wave radiation outside the critical layer while some wave is over reflected. Also, uh, this uh, over reflected wave can reflect back and then they approach again critical level and then they extract energy again. So due to this over reflection process, the wave here confined in this region keep amplifying while they emit the wave outside. And so this is called the radiative instability because it <coughs> has wave radiation outside while it also grows inside the critical level. So this mechanism has been already explained in other situations and it applies same for the stratified vortices. <clears throat> uh, in fact, my PhD thesis is about uh, what happens for, to the radiative instability if we consider the background rotation in either cyclonic rotation or anticyclonic rotation. So I realized that the radiative instability for both cases, they decrease as the rotation increases. And uh, using the WKJ approximation, I will skip the detail for today, but I'm, let me just explain you the concept that uh, as the rotation increases, I realized that there's a region called the potential barrier, which does not allow the wave. And if, increase, if the rotation is increased, then this potential barrier is increased so that the when it's too large, when this barrier is too large, the wave cannot penetrate so that the instability cannot happen. So this, uh, <clears throat> I studied this um, mechanism of suppression for the radiative instability. But in this region where the anticyclonic rotation is quite weak, there is an instability also called the centrifugal instability. So what is a centrifugal instability? 
Also, image in the particle in rotating flow, which is balanced by the pressure gradient for and the centrifugal <coughs> force. And imagine that this particle is displaced out, outward while keeping the circulation. But the and uh, and also consider the case where the flow has the circulation decreasing in radius. And in this case, surrounding pressure gradient is smaller than the fluid, <coughs> the centrifugal force. So this particle keep the uh, uh, force outward so that the, it can keep going out. So this instability is called the centrifugal instability. And this condition is called the Rayleigh's criterion for centrifugal instability. And you can see here that the, this instability is quite destructive. And I found that the vortex in the rotating plane can have some analogy with the Taylor Quay flow, which is a flow between two cylinders rotating differently. And you see that the laminar profile of the Taylor Quay flow is somewhat similar. And then we can match the analogy if we consider the background rotation of the vortex equal to this parameter. <clears throat> where mu is the angular velocity ratio and the eta is the radius ratio between two cylinders. And according to the Rayleigh's criterion for centrifugal instability, it for the Taylor Quay flow, it means that the angular velocity ratio is less than this eta scale, where eta is the radius ratio. And if I draw the diagram in mu space, and this correspond for the vortices, weak anticyclonic vortices here, and cyclonic vortices here, and strong anticyclonic vortices here. And for in this regime, <coughs> this correspond to the centrifugal instability regime. And then for this cyclonic vortices regime, it is found that there can be a structural rotation instability. I will explain in the next slide. And this instability is observed uniquely for stratified fluid. And in this uh, regime called the super rotation regime, where outer ro cylinder rotates faster than inner cylinder, there is no instability reported. So what is the start to rotation instability? So in classical sense, uh, in fact, it is quite analogous to the radiative instability except that the now Taylor Quay flow is a confined flow. So imagine the situation again, that the, there's a wave emission and there's a critical level, or uh, uh, there's a over reflection at the critical level. But this emitted wave, they reflect again at the outer boundary. So they come back to the critical le level. So that the, it's not only one side that over reflection occurs, but it's on both sides. So that uh, compared to the radiative instability where there's an open boundary, here now we have two boundaries and there's a double over reflection uh, <clears throat> on the left-hand side and right-hand side of the critical level. So this is the mechanism for the structural rotational instability. <clears throat> so the question I want to impose is that, first of all, are these instability important? So I will say yes, because uh, Taylor Quest flow has been considered as a laboratory model for understanding the flow in, near the equator. So people try to use the Taylor Quest flow to understand the equatorial flow observed in, in the ocean or in the atmosphere. So yeah, so I've been saying that the Taylor Quay flow has been uh, used for the lab model for equatorial flows. And second of all, this might be more interesting question for astrophysics people. So is there any instability in super rotation regime? So this figure is a parameter space, uh, the phase flow diagrams in a inner cylinder Reynolds number and outer cylinder Reynolds number parameter space. So for unstratified Taylor Quay flow, it is really a well-known flow phase diagram, 
So you, you can observe, depending on which Reynolds number, you can observe many different flow patterns. But more recent finding, uh, it shows that the certified flow, uh, the flow certification can increase the regime slightly more from mu equal to eta square to this mu up to eta. So in this regime where it is centrifugally stable, but we still have the instability, the structural rotation instability. So the question is whether we have the instability in this super rotation regime, which is blue, where outer cylinder rotates faster than inner cylinder, but in the same direction where both cylinder rotate in the same direction. And uh, people think that this regime is quite relevant to the stellar flows with the Q negative, which means that the angular velocity increases with the radius. So people <coughs> or in a, for who work on stellar flows may be interested in this regime. So my answer for this one is yes. So theoretically, yes, we can have the instability even in the super rotation regime. So this is an uh, example of the stability analysis considering the viscous, but in this case, I, I consider the inner cylinder doesn't move, but the, only the outer cylinder rotates. So in this case, it clearly in the super rotation regime. And I found that even with the viscosity, there's some instability, but I found that the this critical fruit number and Reynolds number, if you want to do really the experiment, we need really the setup of radius at least 60 centimeter if you use the salt water. So that, uh, yeah, so that uh, we, uh, this was uh, like my very last point in the end of my PhD. So yeah, but so that uh, I wanted to do the experiment, but it predicts too large setup. So I gave, gave up to do the experiment. But anyway, when I started my postdoc in Seoul, I had the chance to construct the setup anyway. But unfortunately, I didn't have enough money to construct the setup, but I just made the smaller setup. So maybe with this setup, I was not able to observe the instability in a <clears throat> super rotation regime. But anyway, I made the setup. So in this case, I consider the radius about 20 centimeter. And in the experiment, the top is pure water and then the bottom is saturated salt water. And it is quite linearly stratified. And the height, total height is about 30 centimeter, but I kept the water height quite low as 19 centimeter. So that the, in this case, I wanted to have quite strong stratification about this uh, Brunt basal frequency. And for whom who are interested in uh, how I made the uh, stratification in experiment, uh, I mean, there can be many ways, like, and there can be many expensive ways that with some auto controller and make the perfect linear stratification and or in situ density measurement. But uh, I didn't have anything like that. But anyway, I used the method called the uh, double bucket method. And in this case, uh, we can use basically two buckets and one with pure water. And in this case, it is saturated salt water. And for the pure water, we also put some rotating mixer. So in the beginning, we only have the pure water, but as the level of the pure water goes down, this uh, salt water will go in. So, and then uh, this mixer should mix well so that the, it can homogenize the uh, <coughs> water with a slight increase in density. And if you keep doing this, then you may have some nice stratified fluid. Although this one is classical and this is not really perfect, but at least uh, when I measured that, it was not that bad. I mean, it's not the perfect linear profile, but at least it was quite good. <laughs> So using this uh, Taylor Quick flow and the certification setup, I investigated uh, in the parameter space of uh, inner, cil inner cylinder Reynolds number and outer cylinder Reynolds number. 
the how I did the experiment was that I fixed the rotation of outer cylinder, and then uh, I increased the rotation speed of the inner cylinder. And then uh, I first met, uh, found out the point where we start to see the instability. So these samples are all experimental data. And then I check if I see instability and then some transitional state. And when I started to observe the turbulence, I measured like with these cross symbols. And uh, I also com compared the experimental result with my linear stability prediction, which are the solid line. So about the onset of instability, I had quite good agreement between experiments and linear stability analysis. So I can say these uh, <coughs> field circles are about the instabilities and transition. We see some transitional state before the turbulence state. And about the color, I will say uh, in the red color regime, it corresponds to the centrifugal instability at the onset of instability. And in this blue regime, we observe the start rotation instability. And in this green regime, I, I call it mixed because I observed the both centrifugal instability and this SRI at the same time. So from now on, I will not say anything, but I will just show you the experiment that I've done. So this is an example of how the instability develops at the fixed outer cylinder Reynolds number. So at low Reynolds number, we don't observe anything. But as I increase a bit more, you see that the, now you start to see some uh, flow pattern. Then in, if I increase the inner cylinder radiance number more, now I see that this instability flow patterns are everywhere in vertical direction. And then if I increase a little bit more, then I will say the transitional state where this, uh, it's not perfectly axisymmetric vortice, but uh, it's almost uh, axisymmetric. And in this uh, transitional state, it's uh, very interesting me that uh, this uh, azimuthal vortices start to move up and down and these vortices interact each other up and down. And then if I increase the Reynolds number a lot more, then this uh, interaction between vortices become very strong and then uh, it generate turbulence in the end. And this uh, almost uh, axisymmetric vortices are, I realized that this is correspond to the centrifugal instability. Next case with a different outer <coughs> cylinder Reynolds number is that uh, at this Reynolds number, now we see a very different flow pattern. This is a highly non-axisymmetric uh, flow pattern. It looks like uh, around 12, 12, 14. I don't remember exact number. So in this case, it's highly non axisymmetric and this flow pattern start to interact each other and generate quite different transitional stage. And as I increase the Reynolds number a bit more, then it generate turbulence. <clears throat> and in the green regime, I found that the, at this uh, outer cylinder Reynolds number, I observe now two instabilities at the same time. The above is the start to rotation instability and at the bottom it is a centrifugal instability. So it was very interesting to see, observe both instabilities at the same time. And uh, as, as I increase the inner cylinder Reynolds number, then it goes to transitional state and it becomes turbulence in the end. So in my experiment, I was able to categorize three different uh, instabilities at the onset. 
So I observed the centrifugal instability and the SRI, and I observed the both mixed case. And if I did do the image processing, like by cutting the vert, like putting the vertical line here and then draw in time, this was the flow pattern in spatial temporal diagram uh, in vertical length and then in time. So you see that the, yeah, so centrifugal instability was not exactly axisymmetric, but it does like azimuthal wave number one. But I was able to identify this is a centrifugal. And in this case, it is a highly non axisymmetric so we observe different pattern. And in this mixed pattern, which was the most interesting thing, you see that the SRI and then the centrifugal one, they try to compete each other, like SRI try to <clears throat> or invade the vertically down and then, then you it goes up so it keep oscillating up and down in time so this was a very interesting observation and how i was able to identify whether this flow pattern correspond to sri was that basically i did the linear stability analysis using the same parameter and i picked up the uh, most unstable mode at this Reynolds number. And I found the corresponding axial wave number in the vertical direction and then also the temporal frequency. So, and from stability analysis, and then from experiment using the image processing, I do the, or the, I computed the free question of this image in gray color scale. And I found some maximum of temporal frequency and axial wave number. And if I compare together, field circle is the stability from stability analysis and empty circle with some error bars are from experiment. So it, is, it was not really perfect agreement, but at least I was able to uh, observe the same trend. And also in the green regime, uh, if we extract the image processing at the bottom, we have the centrifugal instability, while if we extract the inner image from the top, I was able to observe the SRI. So I was sure that the, this flow pattern may correspond to the SRI. So what I want to do in the future is to continue the work in this uh, super rotation regime. I don't know whether I'm gonna do the experiment like uh, or at least, well, at least I will do some numerical simulation to see if I observe the turbulence and all the stuff in this super rotation regime. And uh, I have talked about that this flow pattern is instability, but in fact, let me say uh, more technically, it, it is already at the equilibrium state induced by the instability. So if you actually do the simulation, the per small perturbation grows in time due to the instability, but this is already a saturated state. So that the, in fact, what we are seeing is the saturated state. So, and I was very curious about the, if the flow is reached at the equilibrium state, what would happen to the mixing of particles, for instance, or what would happen for the momentum transfer? So this kind of concept is uh, this, kind of things are I, what I wanted to research further in the future. So this has been so far about the geophysical world. So I don't know if you have any questions so far or if I continue to the astrophysical part. I guess I, I mean, I still have some 20 minutes. So if you're fine, I will, yeah, I will. I may move to the astrophysical part first, and then I will get the questions in the end. So, in the second part, I will talk about the horizontal shear instabilities in stellar radiative zones, and this is more theoretical work. I guess you know better than me that the, in the star inside there can be a core and the radiative and convective zones. And depending on the mass of stars, their location can be reversed. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I just pick up the two important components, although the structure in real is a lot more complicated. 
So I can say that the, in radiative germ, the fluid is stratified. And we also need to consider that the rotation profile inside stars are differential. So it changes in both vertical, I will say at the given latitude, it, the rotation profile changes in both vertical and horizontal direction. And I'm, for today, I'm gonna talk about this horizontal uh, differential rotation. According to the notations by Matisse et al., uh, people in astrophysics, people have studied the, the, this is the turbulence patch. And then the people have studied the anisotropic turbulence transport induced by either vertical shear instability in vertical direction or horizontal direction. Or we also have the horizontal shear instability that transport the momentum in horizontal direction or vertical direction. And so far, many work has been devoted to uh, <clears throat> describe the transport by the vertical shear instability. But there is a less study on the horizontal shear instability. They can also transport the momentum in both the horizontal and vertical direction. So this was my <clears throat> motivation of my, uh, post, uh, of my work during the postdoc at the CEA. So let's first consider the case at on the pole where the, there's a rotation uh, in vertical direction while the shear is uh, horizontal. So this is, uh, this, in this case, uh, this is a configuration for low mass stars, but it can be reversed like uh, the envelope can be radiative. So first, without any rotation in classical fluid mechanics, there has been known that this type of uh, shear flow. I, in, in my study, I considered the hypertangent <coughs> uh, profile. And in this case, since it has an inflection point where second derivative equals to zero, it can cause the instability and it's called the inflection point instability or I will call it simply inflectional instability. And in this case, uh, even without stratification, we can have the instability, but uh, this growth rate and this instability sustains if we still increase the stratification. And uh, it is found that the most unstable mode is anyway two-dimensional with zero vertical wave number. Uh, and this feature does not change that the maximum growth rate is still at the, for the 2D perturbation. But you see that the as stratification increase, there's a more possibility that the uh, perturbation with the smaller vertical wavelengths can still sustain the inflectional instability. And there is a sort of a safe analogy that the, if n is 10, we can go up to 10 and uh, you, you see the sa same shape, but with a different number. So, in this paper, they reported this self-similarity with the stratification. And this is not my work, but some simulation by these people about the, how the horizontal shear instability can induce turbulence in stratified fluid. So you see that the, compared to the unstratified case, with the stratification, there can be more sort of layered structure with less vertical motion and you see that uh, anyway, this shear instability can lead to turbulent stage. And what if, if you have the horizontal shear and the rotation? In fact, for a certain range of uh, rotation, if you say the vertical Coriolis parameter, non-dimensional light is between one and uh, zero and one, we can have the instability called the inertia instability. And in fact, this inertia instability is the same as the centrifugal instability, except that the, it is now in the <clears throat> XYZ coordinate, but the centrifugal instability has been in the R theta rotating coordinate. So basically the mechanism is the same, but the name is different because it's in the horizontal plane. And for this profile, and, and, and also let me say that the, the inflectional instability 
can depending on the type of mean flow, like hyperbolic tangent can have the inflection point, but for some flow which doesn't have the inflection point may not have that instability. But in this case, it is more about the rotation dependence. So this instability is about the rotation strength itself. So if you consider the rotation, if there's no rotation, we observe this uh, inflection instability. But if you consider together stratification and rotation, inflection instability is still here, but we have another instability at this point. So we have uh, uh, the short wave, uh, in, for the inertia instability, it is a short wavelength instability. And in the implicit limit, maximum of inertia instability is found as the vertical wave number goes to infinity. So they are most unstable or, or wavelengths of the most unstable modes are very different. Uh, for today's presentation, I will talk about two effects which aligns with the astrophysical context. First one is the effect of the thermal diffusion. Since in a radiative, highly diffusive, stably stratified atmosphere, we have the very low Brunter number so that the thermal diffusion is very dominant. So I will consider the limit where this Peckland number is very low. And also I will consider the effect of the non-traditional plane. So we consider the situation at a, any given uh, co-latitude where the rotate, we have both vertical Coriolis parameter and the horizontal Coriolis parameter for the horizontal shear instability. So basically what I did is the linear stability again. And I considered uh, this uh, hyperbolic tangent profile with the both vertical and then horizontal rotation and stratification. The, uh, in this presentation, one problem is that I have two too many parameters. Like even I have the vertical wave number kz and then the streamlined wave number kx. So I have too many parameters. But anyway, I will just summarize some results. And the purpose of this analysis is to find this growth rate. So I can uh, construct the eigenvalue problem where the growth rate is a function of uh, many different parameters. So for today's talk, I will consider only the implicit limit so that the uh, I consider infinity random number and I will study these other parameters effect. So let's first consider the case where, which is the traditional F plane with the horizontal component to zero. So it's on the pole. So with the finite Peckland number, so we still observe the same thing like other people studied in the uh, infinite uh, Peckland number limit that uh, we have uh, inflection and instability with the perturbation on the horizontal plane, which is uh, slightly inclined against the shear direction. So this is a very typical feature of the inflection and instability. And at this other location, we also observe inner inst inertia instability with some wave pattern in vertical direction. So two instability have uh, different shape of eigenfunction. Mm. I'm gonna summarize here about uh, how the thermal diffusion affect uh, both instabilities is that for the three dimensional inflection instability, we found that the edge of the thermal diffusivity increases. I mean, the edge Peckland number goes to zero. The, this instability is stabilized but it doesn't stabilize to zero, but uh, it, it approached to a certain curve. And I found that this uh, curve, this asymptote corresponds to the case of the unstratified case. And for the case of inertia instability, we found that as Peckland number goes to zero, it now destabilizes, but also it approached a curve which correspond to the uncertified case. So why edge Peckland number goes to zero? 
why why as thermal diffusivity increases it goes to unstratified case so the mechanism for that is uh, here so so let's first consider the case with the stable stratification only and imagine a particle at this point that is uh, displaced here and if you look at the uh, temperature between the this particle and the outer case since the surrounding particle is hotter the density is uh, <clears throat> this particle is heavier than the surrounding so it comes back to its original position and this is the generation mechanism of the internal gravity wave but in the case where we also consider the fast diffusion process imagine this particle again displaced at this point but before this particle comes back to its original position since the diffusion is too fast the temperature of this particle increases so it doesn't come back to its original position but it stays upward so that the, we can say that the, if the diffusion process is fast enough this oscillation can be suppressed so that's why if you consider high diffusivity the fluid even though it's stratified they act like a unstratified case or unstratified fluid and this has been observed also somehow mathematically or when I applied this growth rate expansion using the WKJ analysis. So like someone who are interested in the WKJ analysis, please look at this paper. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, here is that I was able to obtain two or uh, the growth rate expression in two limit where there's no thermal diffusivity or where the thermal diffusivity is very large. And in this case, the maximum growth rate has the same expression for two cases, but the first order expression was diff different. <clears throat> but you see that the edge peculiar number from as it goes from infinity to zero, we see that the, this Oh, okay. <laughs> it's good. Oh, we see that the, this sigma one equals when the certification n goes to zero. So mathematically, I was also able to identify that the uh, Peclet number goes to zero limit implies that the, it acts like an unstratified case where n equals to zero. So it was a mathematical proof about this behavior. And also I observed numerically that there, there is a self similarity. So this is an example of growth rate for three dimensional inflectional and inertial instability for different stratification or different ratio of stratification over Coriolis parameter. And if you rescale the x-axis from Peclet number to Peclet number times n square, we see that the for strongly stratified case, uh, it, it forged onto one single curve for large n. And same for here, for the large ratio, if we rescale the x-axis, we go to the, uh, somehow we have some good self similarity. And this is, uh, my case was about the horizontal shear flow but this self-similarity has been already uh, studied for vertical shear flow. And now we introduce even one more parameter by introducing horizontal rotation. So in the parameter space of uh, wave numbers, uh, why these gray dashed lines are for the traditional case. Now, if we introduce the horizontal Coriolis parameter, we have a different growth rate control. And uh, for different parameters, I found that the introducing this horizontal Coriolis parameter leads to very different growth rate control. And in this case, for the inflectional case, uh, maybe the having the horizontal Coriolis parameter can lead to destabilization of the 
inflection and stability. And same for here that uh, I, when I consider the F equal to zero, uh, we have no in inertia instability for the traditional case. But if you have the original comp component and if you have some finite Peclet number, I found that the inertia instability can occur so that the, the traditional regime of the inertia instability was different when we considered this horizontal correlative parameter. So uh, I briefly summarized my result about using the WKJ approximation for inertia instability. So in the infinite Peclet number limit, I found that the unstable range is now extended so without the horizontal component, it was between zero and one, but now we have this additional term. So that uh, if we include the non-traditional effect, it can increase the red possibility of having inertia instability in the wider regime. And in the limit, Peclet number goes to zero, which is more astrophysical. I found that if horizontal correlative parameter is uh, not zero, then it can be unstable for any vertical Coriolis parameter. So it was quite uh, surprising, but at least mathematically it was true. And I also had a good agreement with the numerical result. So in this limit for the Peclet number goes to zero, it means that uh, except at the southern pole, I was able to have all the growth rate at different core latitude. Uh, so, and in this case, it is about the maximum growth rate of the inflection and instability. So this <clears throat> non-traditional instability can introduce more chance to have instability. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean the non-traditional effect introduce destabilization of both inertia instabilities and inflection and instability. So this is an ongoing work about like how I can apply my result from inertial instability to parameter uh, to make some parameterization. So consider that we have some solar-like conical differential rotation, and typically sun has epsilon about zero point three, and we consider the local shear. And then uh, using my WKJ expression, I was able to obtain some kind of local maximum growth rate that has the dependency in the latitude. And then uh, maybe we can use somehow latitudinally averaged growth rate that has this expression. And we were thinking that maybe we can construct some problem viscosities or the we construct characteristic time scale that can be applied in the stellar evolution models. But I'm not uh, uh, really, good that uh, I don't know fully about the stellar evolution model so that uh, I, I need to still work on how I can actually implement my hydrodynamics result to the astrophysics simulation. So this is the summary for today's presentation and thank you for listening. And thank you for my collaborators in geophysics uh, part and in astrophysics part. So thank you very much. <laughs>